All right, y'all, what's going on? This is your girl, your cousin, Tanisha Peoples, live. Uh-oh, we just lost Intel. Hopefully, he'll be back. Because y'all <laughs> heard Zoom is down. We don't know what else or what else they messing with today. But, oh, there you go. We back. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Right, right, it's all right. We push through as always. So we are live with another Talk That Real Shit. Got my homeboy, Jason B. Allen on the line with everybody. And today we have a very special guest. We have special guests, but you know, all our guests are special. So today we have Representative Centel Brown. I'm going to let, go ahead, sir. I'm sorry. You finna speak. But I think that would be a great segue, uh, Centel, if you can go on and just tell us a little bit about yourself, brother, uh, before we go ahead and jump into the show. Yes, absolutely. First of all, I just want to say thank you to Tanisha and Jason for having a platform and avenue such as this where people are able to talk that real stuff and keep it real and be homegrown. I am Arson Tell Brown, a small town country boy from Griffin, Georgia, uh, proudly serving on the Griffin Spalding County Board of Education, where I have the pleasure of serving the constituents of the first district. I was elected in 2018 took office in 2019 and I have learned a lot within this year and eight months of being on the school board as we continuously advocate for children and families and stakeholders within our district. Good deal. Good deal. Thank you for your service. No problem. Thank you. So y'all, before we even get started, I just want to um, acknowledge the fact that we've had some more injustices committed against our community this weekend and I just want to take a moment to a moment of silence to acknowledge it, acknowledge, acknowledge, woo, um, Mr. Jacob Blake, and also the young man who was shot down by police in um, Lafayette, Louisiana. I don't know if they released his name, but either way, he's a brother, and he's a brother that you know um, has suffered from police barbarism and brutality. So I just want to take a second, um, a moment of silence to acknowledge them and the struggle that we continue to be in as black people. All right, y'all, keep fighting the power. Like yes. this stuff is this stuff is devastating to our community, is traumatizing to our community. The fact that we have to see this online, these videos, we need those receipts that these things are happening because you know. People don't, be, people don't believe that black people being brutalized, but at the same time, the fact that we have to see our people literally lynched in the street by police does something to us. Like last night, I felt physically sick watching a Jacob Blake video. So yeah. y'all, you know, keep fighting the power, but also keep keep protecting yourselves and taking care of yourselves um, because it's important. We got to survive to make sure we get we carry this work. Did J Jason up until did y'all want to say anything about that? You know. I always chime into what's happening on social media, just what people's ideas and things are. And um, I find it very interesting. Um, classmate of mine, um, mother of black boys, um, you know, shared her thoughts this morning and basically compared the Meg the Stallion um, situation to this young black father um, who was shot over the weekend. And justifying it, you know, if people do that. I don't understand why people feel the need to say, well, you know, there were so many black men, you know, trying to say that it was Megan's fault that she got shot. Uh, but now we're supposed to be in an uproar about uh, another unarmed black man being shot in the street. And I'm like, why are we comparing apples and oranges? Like, we are educated. We are parents. We are educators. Like, we should know better than this, but we are not being better than this um you know it's a tragedy on both ends um i think that we are getting too lost and trying to say well you know people should be organized around this issue uh but then we all want to jump on the bandwagon when a police officer is shooting an unarmed black citizen in this country and it's two different things two different dynamics and it should not be so close to home that we have to say oh let me change my perspective to understand that this is history, right? Um, Howard University students were protesting against this in the 40s and 50s. So um, I just want people to be reminded of that. Like, you know, this is a father who was shot in front of his kids. 
it's a totally separate situation than Meg Thee Stallion. We should not be comparing apples and oranges. Um, trauma is affecting and hitting home for everyone. And we should be a little bit more sensitive to that, especially if we are parents, teachers, and educators. So I just wanted to put that out there in regards to um, the young brother that was shot over the weekend. Right. Young brothers. Let me say that. Jason, I just want to say to that, you know, it's it's like every time we turn around, it's a situation where us as African-American men are being involved in shootings and killings. Just like what happened in Gwinnett County, lady was on her front porch, mind her own business. I'm sure y'all have seen the video of that lady, mind her own business, uh, you know, not bothering police. Police comes up to her and begins to be very uh, forceful with her. Um, but not every situation turns out to where they are, you know, fired from their jobs or uh, things happen to where crimes are, are committed or they're indicted on, on certain things. And so, you know, we just have to take a posture of prayer as we continue to go out here and we continuously dealing with these social and emotional needs as it relates to the trauma that happens behind these accidents. And so um, I'm just in a position right now to where I'll continue to be prayerful and do everything that I can do, especially when we start talking about social and emotional needs. And so when everything started happening uh, with, with George Floyd, you know, that was one of the things that we pushed for on our school board to, although we were virtual, but we pushed so that we could start getting social emotional programs um, online that, you know, counselors would be able to reach out and instructional coaches will be able to reach out to scholars to help them through this process. I heard from so many African-American boys within in the first district and within Spalding County and their concern was, what do we do next? How do we get over this? How do we heal from this? And so um, it's definitely something that's traumatic and we definitely have to look at the social emotional learning and the needs that go along with this in our school districts. And now, I, brother, I want to push back just a little bit. And Tanisha, I want your thoughts on this as well, um, because we've talked about this a couple of times on previous shows and even in a lot of the work uh, that we do in advocating for better educational outcomes for black and brown children. How are school districts making social emotional learning possible when there are so few uh, male educators of color in the realm in regards to counselors? and social workers. So how effective is the um, ask in regards to social emotional learning in public schools for black children? I, I know I can only speak for what Griffin Spalding County School System is doing. And even in this process of being online, remote learning 100% virtual from last semester, last school year, um, just being able to put it out there to where our scholars know that they have someone that they can go and talk to. And although that there, there is a lack of black males or a shortage of black males in the classrooms or in um, education. And so what we've done is, you know, once they reach out, if there are persons in the community, we have an organization called Urban um, Outreach Association, and they've been awesome mentors to our, the boys in our community. We also have the Caballeros, which is a more, uh, I guess, the upper echelon of um, older African-American men that provide supports and services to uh, the community as well. So from the students being able to go online and fill out the form that shows that they need some help or they want somebody to talk to. And if some of our schools like Crescent Elementary or some of our schools where the population is more uh, white females are in leadership positions and teaching them that they do have a resource within the community. Myself, uh, the other brother that's on the school board, Leader Holmes, as well as Mayor Rodney McCord and some other folks who are willing to step up and step in the gap to provide those supports um, to African-American males and just to our community as, as, as a whole. Yes, we want to focus on our African-American males, but our females are hurting in this as well. And so we got to have um, African-American females who are able to speak to these situations as well. And so I am very thankful to have uh, the AKAs and Griffins, I've been Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha, the uh, Delta Sigma Theta alumni chapter of Griffin, um, as well as some other um, nine D9 organizations that are willing to step up and help with that social and emotional learning as well. 
That's but good. Let me, let me let me ask let me add this point because this is where I get frustrated, right? The fact that we as a community have to supplement those services. Pisses oh me. yeah. And not to say that we shouldn't, right? Because we absolutely have the responsibility in 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 in, in cultivating our kids' education. But also the fact that we our tax dollars go to the system that's supposed to create pipelines for black SEL professionals and black educators and black whatever to have that cultural representation in the school. The fact that those pipelines are non-existent or have been cut off is pisses me off. And so I guess a, 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 a question I have for you as a, as a board member is what kind of happens behind the scenes? And I don't know who has the, the control over hiring. I don't know if it's, you know, it varies per, per locality. It could be the board itself, it could be schools, whatever. But what happens behind the scenes that severs these pipelines in which people can get in? Because even my friend as a social worker in Chicago Public Schools said that throughout her life, she was told that this isn't something that she, she should pursue. And so there's an absence, there's a gap in that representation. So That's what true. happens behind the scenes that leads to this breakdown in, um, in absence or representation? And so, and this is where, Tanisha, uh, this is where it's very important that people who are elected understand the policy issues behind these. And so this is why it's important that when you're going through that, bud that budget process, that you're able to allocate funds for social emotional learning and those needs, uh, whether it may be community things that are doing. Um, one of the things that we've done in the Griffin Spalding County uh, School Board, Board of Education, is that we took out of our 21 schools and, and uh, programs within our school district, um, I authored, I got, well, I would say authored the, the, the fiscal note for or the fiscal part of the budget to where we are giving a grant for $750 to help with diversity, equity, and inclusion. So which goes to that overall culture of that school district. Mm -hmm. What would it be if we could get people like Jason, people like, you know, his father and like Ron Mayo and so many other people here in Georgia that can facilitate some type of in-person discussion or some type of online discussion to our black boys, to our black females and to our, our, our white scholars as well that may be um, uh, being adversely challenged with uh, equity issues because they don't live in the correct zip code according to a lot of our policymakers. So it's That's good right. that, that policymakers understand what can be done legislatively and what can be done on the policy aspect so that you can get those needs addressed. So we are able to address the social emotional learning through our PBIS program. We're able to address culture, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion through our grants that we're receiving. Yes, $750 is, is, is a lot when you're looking at the different programs and different things that you can do to help with diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so mm -hmm. it's up to those hands of those policymakers on these school boards to, uh, to actively seek opportunities and see how they, their legislation or how their policies or resolutions can affect the greater change within the school district. And see, okay. you finna say, let me, cause I'm, man, I'm struggling. I don't know, call me a skeptic or whatever. You know, I just, maybe, maybe I don't lost faith in everything because we throwing around these, these buzzwords, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this ain't me coming at you, Fintel. This is just me, you know, kind of like airing out my frustration. Right. So we throwing out these buzzwords, but we also know that school districts are very political, right? And so it's like diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings are like the thing. That's the shit nowadays. Like, oh, everybody needs this, whether it works or not. It's, it's what it's what the industry or the, yeah the capitalist industry thinks is going to solve this racism issue, but politically and I know what we see in Chicago is that there's a lot of nepotism in place. If you know somebody, you got the job, you got the contract, and That's so right. you can get somebody to facilitate these trainings, but it don't necessarily mean that it's going to be effective because you don't hire your damn cousin who you just want to keep the money in the family. They don't know what the fuck they're talking about, and so I'm. I guess my I don't even know if I have a question. I guess I'm just you know again airing the frustration and talking about like how do we as a people really, really address those challenges that keep us from getting to the resources that we need? The political challenges, the oppressive challenges, the equity challenges, all of those, like, and how can school boards be part of those, of addressing those challenges? 
That's and good. so, and, and, and this is how we become to address those issues, right? So when I got elected to the school board, there was no talk about equity, diversity, or inclusion. None whatsoever in Griffin Spalding, right? All right. So within a year, probably about a year and two months of me being, of me like literally emailing the superintendent and take to use this analogy, putting my foot on his neck or my knee on their neck to make sure that the next board meeting on the agenda item, we're going to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and That's that good. we're able to put our money where our mouth is. So we can talk about diversity, we can talk about equity, we can talk about inclusion, we can talk about equality all day. But if you're mm -hmm. not putting the damn money where your mouth is to mm. get these programs, then it's not really happening. Yeah, you can hire your cousins and you can do all that stuff. But that's why as a policymaker, we make sure that we put things into where they are hiring people that look like us. Uh, one of the, the things that I've been working on as a Georgia school board member in Spalding County is making sure that we have contracts that reflect the 10,341 students of our school district. So making sure when we're getting contracts and people are applying for contracts that we're looking at black women, we're looking at mm -hmm. black men, we're looking at veterans, and we're looking at folks in our community that look like me and you. And so when, when we see building contracts, you know, it used to be where, you know, a lot of black companies, they didn't have the insurance, they weren't bonded and all that type of thing. But there are smaller contracts when we look at the little black and brown kids that are getting speech services. Let's That's bring right. some of those teachers out of retirement that have worked in speech and pathology. When we look mm -hmm. at mentoring programs, we look at the students who have benefited from it. We have so many people in Griffin, Georgia that, that help and give back to their school system. Sherrod Martin, who played for the Carolina Panthers. Bobby Rainey, that played for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. We have so many people and shout out to Sonia, one of my good church members from Shout Temple, Amy Zion, who is on. Uh, but we have so many people that are helping and putting their money where their mouths are so that we can have these resources. So, yeah, I was just like you. Like, y'all just talking shit. Y'all just bringing all this stuff up. And just right. so that you can a, a, a please or appease a certain group of people. But right. let's start putting let's start putting the rubber to the road. Let's start putting some action behind these policies that we're developing so that the greater good of the community can see what we're trying to do and how we're trying to change lives and 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 how we're trying to address the systemic racism within our communities yeah that's good that that part and that actually was one of the things that i wanted to ask about in regards to contracts that public school districts are giving out um, you know, Centel knows this. When I was the chairman of the board for Ivy Prep Academy here in Georgia, um, an all girls charter school, um, I learned a lot in regards to policy development, um, you know, contracts that are given out or issued by schools for services that are provided to our children. Um, and I think that this is such a strong um, footnote in this conversation because contracts equate to money. And how are we spending this money? Um, this goes back to PBIS program, social emotional learning, um, even cultural, you know, inclusive curriculums. And that's something that I wanted to ask you, Centel. How are we moving the needle with that, uh, with getting, especially in this era of social justice and the demand for change, how are we investing those dollars to say, hey, we need to be teaching these black and brown, white, mixed race, Muslim, uh, non-denominational LGBTQ students, how are we teaching them about the work of social justice? More importantly, how are we teaching them about the individuals behind me on this wall that I call the wall of great leaders that have helped to implement change in this country? Because currently right now, that's not evident in our curriculum and it's not being taught with fidelity. I, I do want, I'm going to address that, Jason, but I want to uh, comment to Educator Barnes who left who made a comment. You're absolutely right. And so one of the things I did not say this before when I given my introduction, Educator Barnes, but I am also a former classroom teacher, right? And even, I can't even say former because- uh, He's still teaching. <laughs> I'm still teaching, right? I teach online at Leadership Preparatory Academy, which is a charter school uh, in DeKalb County in Stonecrest, Georgia. So um, the experience that I have as a teacher, we always know that many times that teachers don't have a seat at the table, right? So all this stuff coming down from the top 
board members and state legislators who have no educational experience, have not taught in the classroom, don't understand, uh, don't understand what PBIS is or IEP or none of the above, right? Right. But when you bring that perspective from the classroom to the Board of Education, one of the things that I'm fighting for and that we're going to do is now we're giving, as we look at reopening, we are giving our schools the individual choice, right? And we're going to conglomerate, come together and determine what we're going to do as a school board. But now we're giving the power to the building administrators and those teachers to determine what is best for our school. We know that our education okay. system is not a cookie cutter system. Mm -hmm. So what may work best for Kennedy Road Middle School, shout out District 1, may not work for Rehoboth Road Middle School. What works for Atkinson Elementary School in District 1 may not work for Crescent in District 2. What works for Moore Elementary in District 1 may not work for Moreland Road in District 3. So we want to make sure that we are doing things that are going to benefit our scholars and benefit the families that we serve. Out of the 10,341 students, we have over 5,470 some families that are represented within that. So we got to make sure that we are talking to them. We got to make sure that we are in their faces so that we know what they want. And to that point, Jason, this is why it's important that you elect folks who understand what, how to move and how to get these things, right? That's and so good. one of the things, I had a teacher, uh, Felicia Pittman, who is an amazing teacher. Uh, my first year teaching, she was my mentor teacher, and she teaches in Spalding County. And she messaged me on Twitter and said, hey, I'm interested in teaching a uh, uh, African-American studies, right? And so one of the things that we're going to do to let my school district know, if you, if you guys feel like Black Lives Matter, if you feel that, that history is important, Let's go ahead and get a resolution so we can start looking at how sure. we can get these classes right. And once we get these classes, so I, I would love to see in Spalding County. Now we got some some brave people out there who, uh, you know, at at night they probably during the daytime they got hoods over their face, clans or whatever, so to speak. But I would love to see them in a public vote vote no for a resolution that talks about expanding the minds of children of scholars in our school district. So they understand the historical reference. My Twitter name is my uh, Twitter name is historical educator. So I like to look at every opportunity. There's a historical reference and there's a, a, a moment that everybody can be educated in. So when you look at behind Jason and you look at the Great Wall and you see President Barack Obama, you see Martin Luther King and you see Malcolm X and all these other great leaders their stories need to be told. And it's not told in the sense as to where that it is the civil rights movement and what happened. I was on a committee, was fortunate to help rewrite the standards for history in Georgia, right? And so out of eight people that was on this committee, we were able to look at Alonzo Hernan and his, um, his significance as it relates to the New South period. We were able to take and look at the, the different perspectives of of uh, Du Bois and the perspective of of um, Washington. Drawing blank, but of um, Booker T. Of Booker yeah. T. And we were able to bring them together so that students and scholars can pick which side they would be on to understand the historical reference and the historical context of how Booker T. Washington and W. E. B. were both really really important not only in history but in our state in georgia we look at the 1895 cotton exposition and then we're looking at you know wb and the way that he was able to to advocate to say hey 13th 14th and 15th amendments have already been passed let our folks get our rights now so we have to make sure that when we when we elect people that we that we hold them and we make them accountable for bringing these type of services and resources to our school district I'm the That's type good. of person where you can't tell me no. I don't want to hear no. I want to hear how we're going to make it happen. And if I have to pull back and scale back in order to make it happen, then that's what we'll do because you're not going to be able to tell me no for things that are going to be able to benefit the scholars that we have in our school district. Tanisha, I have hmm. a, um, I wanted to ask you and Centel this question. I was thinking about this as he was talking. Um, I was recently sitting in on a panel for parents here in Atlanta 
And, you know, Griffin uh, Spalding is in the metro Atlanta area. Um, of course, Atlanta Public Schools is inner city. Um, and my, my follow up question around this conversation would be this. If you guys are having this conversation in Griffin Spalding County and parents in Atlanta are still demanding equity in the Atlanta public school system, how do we get our larger school districts on board with passing resolutions um, that require African-American history, um, African-American literature and culturally inclusive curriculum so we can get the ball rolling in other school districts? Wait, well, before, before, you know, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Before, like Griffin Centille, Small. Centille, hold on. Be, before we answer that, before we answer that, because I was, I was thinking like, I think the foundation for this conversation is the importance of the school board in decision making around school districts anyway. Because I don't, right. I don't think we, we take advantage of that as a community. Can you hear me? I don't think that. Um, we, we take advantage enough of that as a community. And so if you could talk about just the importance of the school board in making those demands a reality and the importance of the school board engaging the community so they can understand the power that they have, you could talk about that a little bit and maybe how you as a school board member or your district itself has engaged the community around bringing their ideas to the table. I think that's that's great because we don't... We don't um, Oh, we lost Intel again. Yeah, it could be his internet issues. Yeah. But Tanisha, I like that direction that you were going in. Um, as he's chiming, you know, back in and getting back connected. Um, you know, that policy piece is major. And I don't think that a lot of people understand how that works. You know, being a, a, a teacher as well, serving on a charter school board, um, mm -hmm. I learned a lot in regards to what my principal would say to us in faculty meetings when we didn't get the funding needed to drive out an initiative, he would always tell us to follow the money. And I think mm -hmm. that's really important for parents that are listening, uh, fellow activists, students, uh, teachers, and even supporters for uh, wanting to see better educational outcomes for our kids. We have to follow the money. Um, and then once we follow the money, making sure that our elected officials are getting the right people in place, right? To develop these programs, to drive the much needed change that we are desiring and that we need. Um, so Brother Centel is back on in that moment. Um, I could pass the mic over to him to kind of give us more insight on your question, Tanisha. Yeah, did you did you catch, I guess basically, you know, as a community, we feel like we're already shunned out of schools, right? You are not welcome in schools. And so in that same regard, we may not feel welcome in the boardroom, you know? And so I'm wondering, I, I think it's important to lay the foundation for the importance of community engagement with school boards and how school boards can do a better job in engaging the community so they can bring those demands and ideas to the table. That's good. What kind of internet y'all got in Georgia, Jason? Your internet be jacked up, Neo, J Neo internet be jacked up, Nass and Tail, I don't know. <laughs> Y'all got when um, Georgia song cricket. I don't know. We are blaming everything on the governor of Georgia, yeah, and we are demanding him right now in this moment to <laughs> ensure that our families have better internet access that is stable um, and that is also um, consistent. But Tanisha, to your point, um, this is why we are all joining together to advocate for Wednesday, the National Day of Action, because you know I have colleagues that have been messaging me, you know, this week. And um, <laughs> I'm laughing at the comments. Um, last week and this week that I've had challenges with getting kids online and teachers right. are having challenges with getting online because everyone's internet access is not the same. And so right. if we can have an even slate in regards to providing um, internet access for all families, especially those who are providing educational services and those who need to receive them. So um, right. if you are in any of the 50 states that have, you know, seen some flyers out in regards to Wednesday the 26th, a National Day of Action, um, look up the articles, sign the petitions, get on board with supporting our advocacy work around making sure that we are working through the challenges of um, the tech world, right? As we are educating and reaching families uh, in this pandemic. 
Yeah, and just and just to be more specific, I mean, you know, we got distance learning going on. Uh, we can't help that the fact that we got jackass leadership and they haven't been able to control this pandemic. And as a result, all the kids got to learn from home. And those 15 million kids who don't have access to Internet, how are they supposed to learn? Even today, um, like Toya mentioned on the chat, Zoom was down and a lot yeah. of a lot of districts started distance learning today. And so that's not that doesn't only bring up an issue of the digital divide, but that also brings up an issue of quality, you know, because maybe so many people were trying to log on to Zoom and it crashed the system. I don't know. I don't do I'm not into technology like that. But these are things we have to think about. This is going to be our new normal. So it's not just a matter of come out because people don't have Internet. It's like Internet is, is an essential need these days. We are going we are a technology driven world. And so because of that, everybody needs to have access. And if they don't have access, then essentially they're cut off. So now Internet has become a privilege. So y'all come out. We go be out in Atlanta, in Philly, in Chicago, in Oakland, in D.C., in um, Minneapolis, in, in Kentucky, because we don't have enough conversations about rural access. So y'all definitely come out, show us some support. If you don't feel comfortable coming out um, publicly, then show us some love online. But we need all voices on deck to make sure that our students and families are connected, especially yeah. distance learning. So that was yeah. our little plug. Y'all know we always got an action for y'all. Yeah, we always do an action because that's how you make change, right? So we right. can't just sit back and see what's happening. We have to do something about it. Um, right. Right. Brother Centel, I think we can hear you again, hopefully. All right, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, okay, all right. It says my connection is a little bit more stable now. Yeah, it's it's a little bit muffled. But don't worry, we're filling in the gaps for you, brother. Um, I definitely want to hear his thoughts on the transparency piece, um, you know, so he can speak to his um, experience with that. And I also had a, a good question right, is that this I wanted to. Better? Yeah, we can hear you. Well, I heard you, but I don't know how stable it is. Cause you kind of look like a gif right now giffy uh oh jason what what were you talking about what question did you have so i wanted to you know highlight the fact that in in states like georgia south carolina tennessee alabama so you were talking a lot of our jason had oh, okay I can, we can hear you a little bit Well, so as he's as his internet is delay. coming back in, yeah, it's still it's still a delay, my brother. Um, what about now? One of the, yeah, and we can hear you now. Y'all get the so uh, as it relates to transparency, we want to make sure, like, a lot of reason why on the reasons why our school did not open up was because we did not feel that central office was being transparent with the board. So if you're not being transparent with the board, how can you be transparent with parents and families who are who wants to send their, their kids back to school? And so throughout this entire process, to where now reporting yeah. the number of COVID-19 cases that are happening within the school district, that each school at the updating, each issue, whether they're quarantined or whether they have tested for Bro trouble Brother and asked them we tough questions so that they, they can inform we're going to pause you right there, brother, because yeah. it's, going, it's going in and out. So if you can hear us, just, just hold on one second. I'm going to try to see if I can recap a little bit of what you were saying. And um, then we're going to have the church mothers lay hands on your internet. Yes, we need them. <laughs> like, I, I thought me having the turban on today for the ancestors was going to help with the internet, but maybe not. Um, but I did hear a piece of what you were saying, my brother, in regards to the need for transparency and that um, the central office wasn't being as transparent at as transparent as they needed to be with the school board, um, which was a good point that uh, school board member Centel was making before um, his internet cut out. But that is a major thing. Um, 
the breakdown from the central office superintendent area to the school boards and then to the parent is one of the biggest issues that I have seen parents, um, you know, complain about and bring to the forefront since I've been in education the last 16 years. And um, one of the difficult questions that I was going to ask uh, school board member Brown um, as we're working on getting him reconnected, um, you know, Tanisha, one of the things that I wanted him to talk about was the struggle of being the first person of color or being the only person who is innovative on your board that is working to make change because um, you know, the dynamic is this, as a board, you, you have to have a certain amount of votes to get things passed. Um, mm -hmm. kind of like how our government system works. Right. Um, and so that thing is still at play. So if it's 2020, um, just for everyone who's uh, chimed in and listening, um, if you're a parent, student, activist, um, supporter of education, um, definitely want you to take note on this. If you are in a school district that is just now in 2020 electing their first black female or first person of color, whether they're mixed race or, um, you know, whatever that minority factor may be, um, there's still a lot of work to do because now you have one person who is speaking on behalf of people who have been left behind, overlooked, intentionally not thought about um, in a way of producing um, productive and successful outcomes. And so now you have one person on that board that is trying to drive change and make change. And so one of the things that I wanted to hear from school board member uh, Brown was to speak on the difficulty of young um, African Americans that are running for school boards that are getting pushback from you know, people that have served on boards for years that have not done anything to implement uh, equity. So that was one of the questions that I wanted him to speak on so that we can um, get an understanding of what the true challenges are that these younger uh, and new school board leaders are facing. I mean, Jason, if we think about it, you know, if you're running for any elected office as a black or brown person, right? Historically, we can say that it's not easy, especially an office that mm -hmm. has traditionally or, or a position that has been tra traditionally white, you know, because at the end of the day, a lot of these bureaucracies are trying to preserve the status quo, you know, and so it's similar to, let's just say somebody trying to be the first, you know, state senator or the, the first, you know, congressman or whatever, or, you know, hell, president of the United States, as Obama did, Um what it takes is, and this is why I wanted to dive into the conversation around the importance of community engagement around yeah. school boards, because we talk a lot about elections. And when we think about elections ourselves, we're thinking about national elections. So right now, everybody's on like, you know, are we team um, Jomala or, you know, do we not vote? Do we let Trump stay in office, whatever? But we're not having a lot of conversations about our local elections, specifically school board elections. And I know here in Chicago, we don't even have an elected school board. We have an, right. have an appointed school board, which um, at the same time, I don't know if um, if we were to, it's a lot of conversations around adopting an elected school board, but the way with how the union is so political here, I don't trust it, you know, because everything will be what the, teacher un the teacher's union wants. And so when we think about those conversations, what it comes down to is how involved is the community around supporting these people pushing for these offices and their engagement and getting the community support behind them. So it's a yeah. two way street. We need each other for these changes to happen. Yeah, we do. We need each other to drive this change. You know, a lot of people are, you know, considering, well, if, um, you know, everybody just gets out and votes and Joe Biden wins, then the battle is over. No, it's not. We need people actively engaged in pushing change consistently. Um, you know, Tanisha, you made a good point, and I know that Intel is back on, so I'm gonna pass the mic to him. Um, but we have, you know, people that are opening up doors on school boards, and we have to keep going. We can't just stop there. Um, we need to make sure that they have support, and it's not about just flipping the coin and making everything black or brown, right? Uh, we do want true diversity because there's nothing wrong with having 
different perspectives at the table. The problem is, one, we're not getting all perspectives at the table, and two, we're not respecting different perspectives. And so that is how we start to make change when we have perspectives at the table and then we start to compromise, right, and make sure that everybody is getting a piece of the pie so that we can move this shit forward. Uh, but listen, Cynthia, go ahead, brother. On and not just diversity, but representation, because a running theme on this show is all skin folk ain't kin folk. Yes. So make that point. Let's let's make sure we add that on all the time. You know, I want to go to I want to go back to what Tanisha said earlier. Um, that you know, a lot of times people are either don't want to go or scared to kind of go before city commission or school board meetings. But that's where the true change starts, Tanisha. As an organizer, you know that you have mm -hmm. to hold people accountable. When you go and let's say, because because that's what they do. That's what they do. That's right. They'll go. And they'll go to a city council meeting. They'll talk about zoning issues and they'll talk about certain things. And we've been we've been stacked up almost 20 to 30 people every board meeting getting on talking about the importance of, you know, they need to be back in school, give parents their right. They have the right to choose. And so some of my colleagues, I think, are folding and, and pressuring. But that's what happens. Continue to reach out. And I don't care every meeting you go and you say the same thing. If, if if they give you two minutes, three minutes, or five minutes, you go up there and you say the same thing every time. Eventually, they are going to, they are going, like she said, like, Dr., oh, Dr. Howard Ford, like he always said, you know, they just don't be happy for the invite, but they must talk. So they will mm -hmm. start inviting you to the table so that you can talk because they will get tired of hearing you time after time after time again. And so to your point, Tanisha, start attending and, and get rallying people to start attending those board meetings so that you can see the change that you want. And as it relates to, yeah, all, I, I got a rule. I got seven rules of government, right? And one of them is all politics is local. Mm -hmm. All politics is local. You, I mean, from, from district attorney to school board, city council, those are the people that are really able to represent you because that's where you're able to see the change. When you start talking about judges and district attorneys and solicitors, those people hold the criminal justice system at the palm of their hands mm -hmm. to where some people, because we may have connections and we can get pleas or we can get, you know, less than fines, but not everybody has that right and that ability. Not everybody is connected. So I tell the people that's politics one-on-one. It's just making sure that you stay involved and you know the people that you're voting for. And even let's say if somebody in your political party choice does not win, still stay connected and involved and make your voice heard. You have to be able to speak out loud on purpose. I told right. my scholars yeah. as a teacher, and Jason has witnessed this, um, I always would do an assembly to where they will become state senators and they will mm -hmm. represent actual districts. Uh, two of my students are actually... I think they're on now, Travion and Troy. And one of the things that they said, but Brown, we learned through this is that we have a voice. And so you speak up and you speak out and you and you speak with confidence um, about the issues that are important to you. So yes, local elections are very, very, very important because those judges that are sentencing you, you elect, they're nonpartisan. Yep. That solicitor, that yeah. district attorney, those are people that are supposed to represent you at large and your voice is important. And so if you live in Spalding County, you know, it is like, although I'm on the school board, man, I deal with city issues and county issues because I have relationships with those county commissioners and city commissioners to where if someone calls me in district one, I become whatever you need me to be because I want to make sure that I, your issue becomes my issue because I'm just that passionate about, the people that I represent. My district okay. is, is majority black. And so I want to make sure that people in, in the district one, that they that they are they have the resources that they need and that they can always reach out to me. Um, and I'm always there for them. But yes, you got to make sure that you go and you get involved and you start speaking on these issues so that persons are able to understand what it is that you want. No one will know what you want until you tell them. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. mean, I just feel like there are certain times, and, and this this is what happened to me, Jason, one time. And I said, I've always been a person that's been very vocal. 
But a lot of times, you know, I've been sitting on the board. I'm like, you know, I'm always stirring up something. And yes, we get good results. And But there was a particular issue. We had a principal on the agenda. Um, and so my school board believes that we just lump everything together to save time and we just approve the consent agenda. Hell no, not today, not tomorrow, not never. And because I know Robert's Rules of Order, I know that on a consent agenda, it must right. be unanimous, right? And so if one member disagrees, you got to pull it. That's and right. so I did not pull this item, right? I just, and I just let it go. I voted for the consent agenda, and I was like, damn, Centel, you just did yourself a disservice. And the people that are looking up to you to be the voice of the disenfranchised. And so... From that moment there, I said that I will always speak out on every issue. And so sure. you got to make sure that you're speaking out and that you have a plan in order to get what you need done. I was going to make the point earlier before the, the devil got busy. The Internet um, uh, went out. But we, we praise God for uh, the cell phone and being able no, to come to the car all the time. and get that no, good connection. Right. But on my board is five people. And I have this saying that says, if you want it to be, damn it, you got to have three. And so you got to be able, APS board is a little bit bigger. The cab's a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. Clay County, a little bit bigger. But you got to be able to whip and count your votes and know the people That's good. that are making these decisions. Mm -hmm. So I know that one of my colleagues is very passionate about teachers. So every here's my little secret, y'all. Everything that I do, I wrap it in for teachers. I got one parent, I mean, I got one school board member that's, that loves that loves the fact that parents have a say-so and that parents, 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 parents. So everything that I do, I tailor it so that there's a parent aspect in that. And for me, I'm all about the scholar voice, right? And so we got some good things going on, Jason, that you and I have talked about, which I will be presenting a, a resolution that will include student school board members. And so they will have a seat at the table and they will be able to update us on what their constitu constituency is saying about the school board. And so got to make sure that people have a voice. We want to make sure that scholars have a voice and we give them a voice by being scholar clerks, uh, right. which is something that I, I, I initiated and started on our school board and, and was glad to have the support of the board. We have them being able to make these reports and make updates on behalf of the board as it relates to the constituency and keeping our general public um, involved in what's going on. So, so y'all, what conversations should we be having as a community with, in conjunction with our school leadership about what needs to be done to make sure that these opportunity gaps aren't widened for, widened for black kids during COVID-19? What are the top three priorities? And I'm so, on three and three because we can we can say everything, every damn thing is a problem, which it is. But what are the top three priorities or what are the top three conversations we need to be having now as a black community to ensure that our kids aren't falling and falling deeper into these opportunity gaps? That's probably Number gonna differ, but I'll let uh Representative Brown go first and then I'll share my three. All right. So for me, the top three, because as I as I keep in mind, my focus is always district one, right? It's like it's like a, a parent that has a child and how um, that parent be just get, begins to love that child. I love District 1 because they took a chance with me to represent them. Right. So for me, my main thing is knowing that the, the demographics of people that I serve, I want to make sure that every student has a hot meal. Every student, because there are food disparities going on right here in Georgia, right here in one, uh, several of our 159 counties, right? So I want to make sure that all students in District 1 and in, in the Griffith Spartan County School System, that they have a hot meal. Now, Number look, two, let me interject real quick. One thing that the state of Illinois is doing is giving um, families $350 a month for food if you are on public assistance. So Damn, that's something y'all will push and um, any families doing distance learning. And I, I haven't read deep into the, like, I haven't gotten into the weeds but I know a couple of friends that already got their bag, so y'all might want to push that to camp. Yeah, I, well, Alabama is doing something very similar. Um, I have been in the weeds a little bit on that. Alabama is doing something very similar um, that connects to uh, a program that Georgia already has. So I'm hoping that um, you know more school board members will uh, look at what the districts in Alabama are doing to see how, because their program is more closely to what Georgia has already in place. 
um, so they can get just that because it is about getting the bag to make sure that these families are getting the nutrients and healthy foods that they need. Right. Good deal, Tanisha. Sorry. Yeah, and, and, and that's really good. And yes, I know Georgia does have uh, assistance available, but I want to make sure that from from on Sunday, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, that our students are able to eat. And then on Thursday, they're able to pick up another meal that would carry them to the next week. That's something I'm very passionate about, making sure that our scholars in our school system have um, the, nutri the, the, the nutrients that they need in order to be good scholars. The second thing is internet access for our scholars. We are actually now, during the hours of school, we're deploying buses to go out that have hotspots and children are able to connect to those hotspots. Our buses are also delivering meals. And so making sure that that internet, you know, and, and you know, I can't, because next week, Tuesday, right, I'm going to be able to talk. I'm going to really have a passionate story and a plea as we continue to look at more hotspots and purchasing more devices and hotspots for our students because just being, an, and I, I've heard about all the issues that Cobb County is having with their internet. And I'm in Cobb County right now. Um, and so was not even able to log on, but I'm able to log on my phone. So I have a more passionate speech coming up on Tuesday as it relates to making sure that all have That's access good. to internet. Um, and lastly, it's to make sure that our teachers are not overworked, right? And so during this process, teachers are working more than they work when they've been in the building. I have That's teachers right. that are responding to emails and on phone calls till 9.30 and 10 o'clock at night. And they have their own families. They have their own children. They have their own stuff that they have to take care of, whether it's fixing food for their families, um, still updating lesson plans and getting Google Classroom straight and updating the links with all the different resources. So we just got to make sure that we approach everything within this season with grace, right? We got to make sure that, that our teachers, that our teachers are not being overworked and they should not. I mean, help, damn it, guys. We'll keep it real. We're talking the real shit. We are fighting right now for teachers not to have to clean their rooms. Yeah, no, that's right, because, brother. Because there's a custodian shortage. And why in the hell would you want me to vote to send your child back to school and we can't keep the schools clean? We can't mm -hmm. clean the service. We don't have enough machines. Can't clean the buses. So why in the hell would you want me? Because as soon as it happened, you're going to say, oh, well, the school board did this. And so, and so I just want to make sure that number one, our, our, our babies got food to eat, that they have internet access, and that our teachers are not feeling overworked and overwhelmed, right? And so okay. there, there, there is something that we can do. I talked about it earlier, that if you want it to be, damn it, you must have three. And so right now we're looking at, um, and, and somebody just said, Nehemiah said, how do the babies uh -huh, that's the IEPs a, a, continue uh, receiving uh, ho -ho. learning? And so here's what we're doing, Mr. Frank, right? And Griffin Spalding County Schools, we're making sure those scholars have IEPs that the counselors and, and the literacy specialists and central office, we're reaching out and we're still servicing all of those scholars. So if you have an IEP, this is where the modifications come in and versus accommodations. And so we're making sure that all those accommodations are being met. We also have paper packets. Um, we're making sure that modifications are also met so that every child can be successful during this stint of remote learning. Hey, that was good, brother. Um, I'm going to go ahead and chime in with my three. I think they're very similar. Uh, but my first one is access because we mm -hmm. have all families, teachers included, staff members that need access to um, the devices, that need access to Internet. But then also, too, when you think about access, my students with special needs or exceptionalities, they need a different type of access. Gifted and talented students need a different type of access. We have all scholars that have different learning styles, right? So they have a different type of access that they need in regards to what is being presented to them and being taught. Uh, my second area is innovation. I think that we definitely need to take advantage of this time to reimagine schools. We need to think about how can we do school differently? We cannot just bust kids back into overcrowded schools. That's the problem right there. We cannot bust kids back to schools that are not properly clean, that have lead water coming out of the water fountain. So we have to take a hard pause um, that my fiance would say during this time and really rethink what we're presenting in education, right? Um, the third thing is preparedness. Um, our teachers are not prepared. Our staff members are not prepared. Our school leaders are not prepared. 
we need to make sure that we are prepared for situations like this. That means making sure that our base, our foundation is protected, is safe, they are okay. Those are our frontline workers, school bus drivers, nurses, um, administrators that are opening up the buildings and working the front office uh, desk, paraprofessionals that have to work in small groups and service those scholars um, that do have exceptionalities physically, right? So I wanna make sure that, you know, in those three areas, we're covering everyone and we're supporting everyone. So I guess I'm supposed to go next, right? <laughs> I, <laughs> I, well, you could agree. I mean, cause you know, I'm one of those people, my friend tells me all the time, like Tanisha, just work your corner. You know, and I have a hard time working my corner because I'm trying to solve all the problems. And so in trying to solve all the problems, I consider all the problems. But if I had to name three things, the first thing would be, because I often think about who's fighting or what representative body solely supports students and parents. And I don't think there is one. I don't think the teachers union does it. The school district doesn't do it. City leadership doesn't do it. So who has to do it? People like me. I was going to say MF is like me, but I want to, you know, I want to use that language. It's all good, yeah. but we got you. <laughs> Activists have so to do it. Think about that. Um, that translates into resources. That translates into funding. That translates into support. And so making sure that, again, every household, not every household, every child has a device with quality internet is important for distance learning. Making sure that like both of you guys said, what Tintel said that these kids are fed, all of them, not just some of them, because we like to have a lot of conversations about low income students um, or free and reduced lunch students, but it's hard to sometimes track those homeless students. And so to make sure right. that we're seeing all of the kids is important. Um, I don't know the other two things, Y'all might have to catch the hope in our ways this week <laughs> because I need time to think about it. <laughs> to, to Jason's point, to Jason's point about innovation, right? Mm -hmm. Do you know that teachers can really use this time to really get scholars to really start understanding and mastering content? Um, and I and I know this is so. Uh, there's a, it, 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 if it wasn't so, I wouldn't tell you, right? Um, students were having a hard time last month. Oh man, it's 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 getting back. Lord Jesus, y'all keep As his I was trying to, get them to understand okay, the nineteen was 1946, three governors controversy, right? There were several gaps in getting the students to understand. So scholars are always on their phones, they're always on devices, they're using TikTok, they're using Instagram. And so I had them to use TikTok. I had them to use the different social media sites that to create videos that shows their understanding about the 1946 government controversy. When we That's test good. and teachers need to understand during this time of innovation, everything is not going to be a multiple choice test. That there are different things that they need to do that's going to be able to determine how they're learning, whether they're being proficient in certain areas. And so through this, it, let innovation be your portion. Let innovation lead you and, and, and guide you in how you're going to structure your lessons so that your your scholars are able to learn that's good wait before we before we we got a few more minutes and i think this is a very important question that miss joy s jones just asked she said are you concerned it's on the screen so y'all can read it but just to show y'all yeah. my cps education was worth a damn um are you concerned that there will be increased disciplinary referrals due to children's excitement and activity levels being back in school and teachers overwhelmingness i um, definitely do Yes, yeah, because I it's already do. happening. There's a um, uh, since I don't know if you remember the the county. I can't think of it off the top of my head. It may be Cherokee that had the police get involved with a unsecure um, you know, internet service that the district was using. And of course, it was middle school students, and they did what? They were involved in you know thinking it's funny, right? Because it's it's middle school students. <laughs> Um, Centel taught middle school, so I know this brother gets this. We know that this is a coming of age time for these kids, right? So now you have police officers that are on social media going back and forth with black and brown kids about showing inappropriate things during class. But why do we have the local police department involved in an issue that the school leaders and the SROs of the schools should be handling. And I'm giving that situation to say this, if we are this quick to call the police in 
to an internet issue regarding discipline for virtual learning, then that gives you just a small glimpse to what we're calling the police to actually do in schools when the kids are actually getting an attitude with the teacher and saying, okay, call my mama or whatever that may look like, right? So, you know, we have to take this time to even with innovation, go back and revise school discipline, behavior and attendance policies that if we really look at the data, were probably influenced by local state data that reflects discipline issues that are focused in on black and brown children. You know, and I think what, what needs to happen is, and one thing that we did on my school district, I was a fan of. Now, when I was in the classroom, I was, I didn't have many, I didn't real. I could probably count on one hand a time of year how many discipline problems I had, right? Um, but the, the thing is, is that progressive discipline works, right? Yes. And so as a school district, when you start with progressive discipline and and you're able to connect scholars with the benefit of having a relationship with an administrator or a teacher, just to have that relationship, it is, it is mind blowing what scholars will do if they have that relationship with you. And so I think school districts need to move towards a, a policy to where they enact all of their schools uh, to, to look into progressive discipline so that you're able to handle these issues. You're able to do an antiseptic bounce within a classroom to send to another teacher's room. You're able to make phone calls to the parent and try silent lunch before actually getting to a write-up. And so, yeah. um, Nehemiah, I just kind of explained what progressive discipline was within of what they need to do and how. Uh, and then, like I said, with all of this, because we're in uncharted waters, because emotions are at all time high, let's just continue to approach and and approach these things with grace so that we leave emotion out of it and that we leave room for error so that we can get these things right so that the experience for our scholars is, is what would count in the end. That's good. Let me add this, um, Joy. I think that there are going to be a lot of disciplinary issues, but connected to Black kids' trauma. Um, and when Cynthia says that let's um, let's move with grace, let's talk to I'm 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 applying that. Hey, Karens out there, that to criminalize um, Black boys and you know just whatever y'all do to Black girls approach this with grace because what y'all don't understand is that as a community again we've experienced so many so much trauma in these past i mean in our whole lives but in these past couple of months it's been yeah. held so we're not only facing again a a, a a a pandemic of coronavirus we're facing a pandemic of racism and so when yeah. our kids come to class upset be, because of george floyd and brianna taylor and you know recently jacob blake and they may act out don't suspend them. Try having a conversation with them. Try understanding yeah. what they may have seen on their block or what they may have seen on social media or what they may have heard one of your cousins say. So I think that if anything, and as Nehemiah said, they're getting them ready for prison, do your best to disrupt the school to prison pipeline. That's right. And if not, if we see these discipline rates rise, then we know what the fuck is going on. So that's yeah. why I think we're going to see a lot of discipline behind black kids and their trauma and not having that support in schools to help them um, navigate those waters. And so if I could add to my second piece around what conversations need to happen is social, emotional, social and emotional supports for our kids and families because of the shit that we've gone through these past couple of months and as black people as a whole. That's good. And I, I wanna add to that too, you know, the trauma that's happening in households, we have to also think that you know, a significant number of people have lost their jobs, right? So that's income coming into the home. So just Toya in the spirit, domestic abuse is happening in homes that children are seeing. There is no way to escape. Then think about those kids again, coming of age, middle school, high school, that are dealing with their sexuality and coming of age. And now they're trapped in a home where a parent doesn't agree with that or understand that. And they don't have an outlet at the school for someone who is teaching um, you know, progress. Uh, progressive mm -hmm. discipline is also about engagement and building strong relationships. We have to take into account that our students are on social media. They are seeing these killings and shootings most times before their parents are even finding out. So what does that do 
to our young men and our young women? And mo moreover, what does that do to their counterparts that are seeing their fathers, their brothers, their sisters, their aunts, their moms, their grandparents being shot in their homes, in their cars, in shopping centers, in parking lots, in the middle of the day at night? What does it do to their counterparts that are seeing this and then have to come to schools and be engaged? with them right so we have to also take that into consideration that you have mixed populations in schools where you know everyone isn't all black everyone isn't all for black lives matters everyone doesn't even think that you know some people's lives matter at all so um we have to you know don't take trauma lightly um yeah. we, we can't take it lightly so we gotta we gotta wrap up y'all um so y'all come on with y'all quick Closing thoughts for this conversation. I said, Cynthia, we know you struggle a little bit with the internet, so we yeah, gonna we gonna let Cynthia kick it off first. <laughs> you know, whatever, whatever, real, like the real shit that you want to get off your chest, we gonna go ahead and let you get that off. Um, I just want to say to Jason and Tanisha, thank you for having a platform like this to where we're able to express ourselves and get shit off our chest and talk the real shit. And uh, to my residents of Spalding County, thank you again for. You're trusting me to advocate on your behalf. Uh, when I ran, I said that we would advocate for brighter futures because I am an advocate for brighter futures. And I just want to say to everybody else out there listening, even to the educators, do not be afraid. Um, ask your school board members to to look into a whistleblower policy. Mm, um, one of the things that I'm working on right now is a whistleblower policy. So that because I, I get tired of hearing when teachers reach out, please don't mention my name. Please don't mention my name. And so to create a whistleblower policy so that you can feel comfortable enough to go to your administrators and go to your school board members. And so you can express your concerns, because at the end of the day, we're all in this together. We all have to work together. The right hand, the left hand, the right foot, the left foot, hokey pokey, turn yourself around, all of that. So let us just continue to work together and let us continue to speak out. And in the words, John Lewis, cause good trouble, necessary trouble. It's going to help and benefit the scholars of today for tomorrow. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, and that was so politically inclined, right? You know, I could tell my brother was speaking as a school board member, but also as a leader, man. Um, definitely appreciate those last words. Tanisha, what I would say in regards to closing the conversation is we have to get behind teachers. Um, teachers are calling out the injustices that are happening in our schools every day. Um, if teachers are wanting to walk off the job and protest and say, listen, we're not going back to face to face. We are seeing too many issues happen. We're taking a stand for our students um, and our fellow staff members. They got damn it. We need parents to be standing behind them because Satel said it best. Why would we be wanting to send children and teachers back into schools that cannot properly be cleaned? buses that cannot thoroughly be cleaned. Why would we want to put anyone in harm's way? We have to rethink education. We have to do something different. So I hats off to fellow teachers, uh, school leaders that are making hard decision decisions, parents that are struggling through this and working through this, continue to partner with your teachers. Uh, but most importantly, in this pandemic, like Dr. Fuller said on our very first show um, on this new platform is that we have to protect black and brown children by any means necessary. And I'm gonna throw in there that we need to protect black parents, black and brown parents, as well as black and, black and brown mixed race or any educator that is going back into a facility for face-to-face -face learning. We need to be protecting them by any means necessary. And I'm just, I'm just gonna repeat something that I said earlier, um, similar to Jason's final remarks is that we need to stand alongside parents. I think that parents and students are the most underrepresented in this conversation. They're often not invited to the table and they're suffering in silence. And in their right. suffering in silence, we go rock for them and with them. And we are rocking with them for the plug Wednesday, internet yes. action. Um, check our Facebook pages, our social media pages. We check the Citizen Air platform, check the Bright Bean Pack platform, check the Voice to Action platform for the national internet for all actions, because in order for our kids to learn, they must have internet access. That's so right. We are rocking with and for parents and students. So y'all join the action with us. And with that, 
We are out. We'll talk that real shit. We'll check y'all next week. Until that time, be good, be safe, and be healthy. And keep fighting the power. All right. Peace, y'all. All right, y'all. God bless y'all.